Last week, Facebook, Instagram and WhatsApp all stopped working. The six hour outage on October the 4th was the result of a misconfiguration. Facebook engineers changed a setting that defined how their backbone network communicated and switched off DNS, the domain name system, which is how the internet finds things. The result was that not only were Facebook systems disconnected from the internet, they were also disconnected from each other. Facebook take a sophisticated approach to software engineering, but the truth of big complex systems is it happens and failure is always an option. This isn't the only outage that Facebook have experienced. So what can we learn from this and previous outages about how big systems fail? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. Their links are in the description below, so please do check them out. My new book, Modern Software Engineering, is now available for pre-order. Uh, on the Inform IT website. Get a big discount and look at the description below. The error in the configuration of the BGP settings locked Facebook staff out of their own systems. Internet protocols were designed to be resilient in the face of nuclear war, so Facebook did a pretty thorough job of managing to break those protocols. This is the kind of problem that is almost impossible to predict. And to guard against a problem, you need first to imagine that it can happen. Part of the job of an engineer is to imagine how our systems can go wrong, but few people would have predicted this one. The entire Facebook network was disconnected from the internet, and the tools that everyone inside Facebook uses to access the data centers where Facebook systems run couldn't find those systems and so didn't work. So not only was the system down, but they couldn't get into it to start fixing it. The press said that this was rather like locking your keys in the car, which is a pretty good analogy, but it's probably more like locking your keys in the car than leaving the car somewhere in the world's biggest airport car park and forgetting which airport it's at. I confess that I'm not a big fan of Facebook. I don't like their products very much and I dislike how they use them. However, I've said for a long time that Facebook are good at the engineering aspects of their job. They take a sophisticated approach to continuous delivery and infrastructure as code and many other practices that viewers of this channel would admire. Good engineering is demonstrated in part with how well we deal with failure. How quickly can we recover? The fact that after a disaster on this scale, Facebook managed to get their systems back up and running in six hours is pretty good, actually. Imagine for a moment that a meteorite destroyed a building where your business operates from. How long would it take you to get back to normal? This was kind of a software meteorite strike. And Facebook were back in six hours for most of the planet. There is always, or at least there should be, something to learn from failures like these. The failure was in the configuration of the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, which is the protocol that defines the underlying global routing for information on the internet. It defines the availability of routes that the information can take, and that information is then used by DNS servers to make routing decisions. This is fairly esoteric stuff. I could comment on treating every change in our production systems as an experiment, on trying to find ways to rehearse configuration changes before making them, which is a strategy that I encourage people who practice continuous delivery to adopt. But, as I said, we can't predict every failure. So in addition to working experimentally, it's also vital to work empirically. We need to learn from the reality of our systems, as well as our theoretical understanding of them. This failure is mostly in the realm of the web monsters who structure the internet. However, while looking into this problem, I found another report, another Facebook outage. 
that happened earlier in the year in April. This failure is much more representative of the problems that you and I are more like are likely to face if we work in large successful systems. This is more representative of one of the most common ways that big systems fail and about what kind of things we can learn when these things happen. So let's take a look at this one too. This is Facebook's statement on this earlier incident. Early today, Facebook was down or unreachable for many of you for approximately two and a half hours. The key flaw that caused this outage to be so severe was an unfortunate handling of an error condition. How we handle error conditions is one of the commonest causes of production outages in software systems. In a study from a few years ago, the commonest line of code hit during a production outage across thousands of examples that they looked at was a comment saying, add error handling here. The study goes on to say that 58% of such outages are caused by simple defects in the error handling code that could have been fixed with simple tests. This wasn't one of those cases though. The Facebook statement goes on to say this, an automated system for very fine configuration values ended up causing much more damage than it fixed. The intent of the automated system is to check for configuration values that are invalid in the cache and replace them with updated values from the persistent store. When you have copies of information in two or more places, that always adds exponentially to the complexity of any system. Caching is a good tool for speeding things up, but cache accuracy is always a somewhat tricky problem. Just in case you aren't familiar with the idea of cache in software, this is the Wikipedia definition. A cache is a hardware or software component that stores data so that future requests for that data can be served faster. Caches are a great idea and widely used uh, uh, to deliver data quickly to where it needs to be. But the complexity comes when the original source changes. How do you recognize those changes and quickly and efficiently get them to the caches that are where the people and services get their data from? How do you detect that the information in those caches is current and correct? Facebook goes on to say, this works well for a transient problem with the cache, but it doesn't work when the persistent store is invalid. This is already scary. We have a process focused on detecting invalid entries in a cache. What you do when the cache is wrong is go back to the original source and refresh. But if the wrongness is actually in the original source, we have a loop and potentially that's an infinite loop. Today, we made a change to the persistent copy of a configuration value that was interpreted as invalid. This meant that every single client saw the invalid value and attempted to fix it. Facebook didn't say here whether the config change was really a mistake or not, or whether it was just identified as a mistake by their cache monitoring systems incorrectly. In the context of what happened next, it probably doesn't matter too much which one of these it was. In this case, though, the situation was made consist considerably more complicated by the automated response that was designed to minimize problems. Because the fix involved making a query to a cluster of databases, that cluster was quickly overwhelmed by hundreds of thousands of queries a second. Actually, this is a fairly common cause of catastrophic failure in software systems, and even in mechanical systems too. This is the result of the creation of an unconstrained feedback loop. The configuration error in the cache is detected. Every single client saw the invalid value and attempted to fix it. And the route to fixing it is a bottleneck, in this case, a cluster of databases serving the original value. So now the cluster of databases is overwhelmed and the problem just gets worse. Every time a client got an error attempting to query one of the databases, it interpreted it as an invalid value and deleted the corresponding cache key. This started the cycle again by forcing it back to the overloaded database cluster. Now, in the middle of the, of the outage, the system is being asked to work even harder. 
beyond its capacity to cope. The cache entries are meant to take load off the original source of the information. These cache copies mean that you can read the value without touching the original. But now the automation thinks wrongly or rightly that the value in the cache is wrong and so dumps it. Remember, there are lots of these caches. So now every one of them needs to go back to the source to refresh its copy with what it assumes will be the correct value, only it isn't. So now there's an explosion of extra demand on the original source. The whole network is overloaded with this explosion of extra work, applying so much load onto the systems that are trying to correct things that they just can't cope. Once in a situation like this, there's only really one solution. You have to break the feedback loop. In this case, Facebook stopped all traffic to the database cluster. The only way to do that is to turn the site off, so they did. This stops the situation getting worse, but they still need to figure out what actually caused the problem in the first place. And although I haven't been involved in an outage quite on this scale, I have been involved in a few technically similar failures. During the, this period of the accelerating feedback loop, it's easy to become blindsided, fixated on the symptoms and find it difficult to focus on the evidence and identify the causes behind the problem. If you just turn everything back on again, if the system is any good and deterministic, then it will recover to the same catastrophic state and start feedbacking looping again. This is a tough situation to be in and the pressure is on. Once Facebook had identified what they thought to be the problem and corrected it, they could restart. My bet is that they were, shall we say, rather focused at this point. This is a very stressful time because for a system of this scale and complexity, you can't really predict everything. Part of being an engineer is the need to become empirical in our decision making and seeing how things really play out in the real world. In this case, the engineers at Facebook fixed the problem with the configuration change and they disabled the system that attempted to correct the cache before restarting the system. They sensibly controlled the restart, allowing people onto the system gradually and monitoring it closely to see if there were any further problems. Services were restored incrementally, which is only sensible. Facebook wrap up their statement with this. We're exploring new designs for this configuration system, following the design patterns of other systems at Facebook that deal more gracefully with feedback loops and transient spikes. So let's think a little bit about that. The first thing that I should say is that I am not saying that I would necessarily have done any better. Facebook do a good job of development on the whole, whatever you think of their products. Despite this, things went wrong. This is always true, this is the essence of engineering. The illusion that we can get this kind of thing right first time is exactly that, an illusion. We have bridges and aeroplanes that work, but they work because the early versions failed in sometimes difficult to predict ways, and we learned from those failures and corrected them over time. Engineering is a process of learning and discovery. And we learn most when things go wrong or at least we should. However, hindsight is a wonderful tool. So let's think in the, in the view of hindsight. Error handling is the place where most production failures happen. So thinking carefully about your error handling is important. This kind of out of control feedback loop is a reasonably common failure mode for complex distributed systems. Resilient systems need to detect when they're under stress and back off. You need to cir circuit breakers to break the feedback loops when you're in under this kind of stress. And particularly in distributed systems, you need to monitor back pressure so that you can identify when the system starts to be under such stress and then signal it upstream and slow down the inputs that are causing it. This is relatively common practice in handling errors in distributed systems. A good approach is to have some kind of staged process that backs off in terms of time when responding to such errors. So first time you see an error, you signal the problem. If you see another problem before the first is fixed, you pause for a while before signaling the problem again. 
If you see the problem yet again, maybe don't send any signal at all, but log the error and try much later. This is based on control system theory and is called adding hysteresis to the system. I don't know if Facebook system did any of this, but I kind of doubt it in this case, and it should. The next thing that I'd be looking for if I worked for Facebook is to see if there's a way that I could have tested for this kind of failure. Could I write a test that simulated an invalid value being added to the source, cached, and then rejected by the cache validity checker? If I'm honest, I may have thought about adding the hysteresis to the error handling as I've done this kind of thing before, and I'm pretty sure that my team would have tested the failure case, for, certainly, but would we have thought of testing for the start of the vicious feedback loop? Probably not. But, in this, but this is where empiricism comes in. I would certainly create that test now and see it fail against the current system before fixing the problem and running the same test against whatever alternative we came up to see that we'd solved it. One test that may have helped would have been um, some kind of in-production chaos testing. Um, injecting failures into a production system is a good way to drive the pace of empirical discovery. The trouble with chaos testing like this is it's usually pretty generic. Uh, in this case, if it were specific enough to trigger this failure, then it would probably have triggered the same outage too. Maybe it's unreasonable to expect that chaos testing would have been targeted enough to cause this failure safely. Another interesting thought is that maybe the emission here is more to do with monitoring. Why wasn't the feedback loop detected and short-circuited sooner in the course of the failure? Actually, a better question is, how, how should we make sure that future feedback loops in error handling will be detected and short-circuited? I think that there are a few lessons that we can learn from this failure. The first is, to quote the Mythbusters, that failure is always an option. Systems on this kind of scale are complex and dynamic. The trick to systems like this is to use all of our knowledge and experience to do the best job that we can, but not to trust ourselves to be right. In fact, assume that we're probably wrong. We need to think carefully about what we measure and monitor to highlight where we're wrong. And we need to think like engineers and spend time and effort imagining as many ways that we can think of that our system can go wrong. If I am to be critical of the Facebook engineers at all here, it is that if this kind of problem is kind of common enough to think about what, what if the data store was invalid at source? I think I would have thought about that. I think my old team would have thought of asking that question. Being empirical means that Facebook should learn from this though, and not only fix this problem, but try and mine the deeper, more general lessons. Adding hysteresis into any potential error handling loop is a good idea. Monitoring feedback pressure in comms matters in big systems if we need them to be resilient. Finally, I think all change is best thought of and carried out as a form of experiment. That forces you to think about the variables that you need to control so that you can understand the results. And thinking this way forces you to think about the feedback that you need to monitor to collect those results. I wonder, if that kind of approach may have prompted people to consider this kind of failure for the cash cleaner. I don't know if I could have done any better than the Facebook team. I know that failure is always an option and that I have been surprised in bad ways by my own production systems in the past. None of this is meant to be smug. Both of these incidents were nasty, complex failures, but there are lessons in these failures that we can all learn from. Thank you very much for watching.